Welcome to Future Customer Value, where global thought leaders share their career-defining moments. Welcome to the latest episode of Future Customer Value. I'm excited to have Amber Monroe on the show today. Thanks so much for joining, Amber. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yes, for sure. For those of you who don't know Amber, she is had an awesome career in the healthcare world and traversing a lot of customer success and customer experience. Amber started off her career in the world of healthcare in the hospital space at Optum, where she was a regional account manager. This is before you dove into software world, you know, yeah. at first. So spent a couple of years owning our revenue cycle management teams inside of hospitals, all the bills, payments, coding, learned a lot from our pre-chat call, which mm -hmm. is a whole different world for me. Um, which led then her into working t in, in the SaaS world and the world of electronic health records at Practice Suite and a few other companies where she was the director of customer advocacy and um, got her feet wet into CS as we know it in the, in the SaaS world. Uh, following that, Amber was the director of customer success at Home Care Pulse, where she's owning implementation, CSMs, and is now currently at Paradigm Seniors, where she's the vice president of customer experience. So a lot of awesome stories to be told okay. here and really excited to, to dive in. So Amber, would love to hear uh, what you're up to right now in your new role and congrats on every, everything you've been doing so far. Thank you so much. I'm super excited. I, I just recently got this promotion to awesome. VP of customer experience. So it's kind of fun and it's like a week fresh. Um, yes. So there's a lot of things I'm diving into, but uh, no, I'm really, really excited to be here. I've learned a lot in the short time I've been in the CS space and in the SaaS space, and uh, really excited to dive into the conversation today about all those different experiences and all about all the things that I've learned along the way. So it should be a good conversation for us. Awesome. Well, I, I'm looking forward to it as well. This podcast is brought to you by Foresight, a full service value realization platform designed to help you unlock growth in every single account. For more information on Foresight, please email them at info at gainforesight.co. That is info at G-A-I-N-F-O-R-E-S-I-G-H-T dot C-O. And they'll be in touch. Uh, well, let's start back in the world of the hospitals when you were in, in regional account management and owning, as we discussed, RCM teams, revenue cycle management and um, talk to us about that world because a lot of our, our listener typically doesn't understand the world outside of SaaS, right? We're focused yeah. on the SaaS, SaaS professional. Yeah. But what does account management customer success look like in the true healthcare setting? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't know when I first joined because I was really working predominantly inside of hospital organizations. So I was working in the hospitals. I was up on the patient floors. Um, right before I joined Optum, I was working for this health system, and he used to go up on the floor with uh, uh, patients that did not have any insurance benefits to cover their service days. And so when I was on the floor, I was helping them get connected with payer lines like Medicaid. Um, and at the time, they had presumptive eligibility for patients that were pregnant or just had a baby. And so we'd help make sure they would get that assistance that they need, the insurance. Sometimes it was collecting financial information. So I was accustomed to working with patients day to day in all different financial situations. And I really had a greater need to look into other organizations like Optum, which happened to be, um, it's like the payment side of the healthcare space too. So Optum is connected with United Healthcare. The United Healthcare, probably everybody in, in the US knows about UHC. It's one of the biggest insurance companies in, in, the, in North America. Um, and uh, they also have this other side of their business called Optum. And I joined Optum as this regional account manager and essentially I got a set of hospital clients in the Midwest. So I had a hosp couple hospitals in Missouri, a couple hospitals in Kansas, a couple hospitals in Iowa, and then I would travel to all those different hospitals um, and I would build relationships really with leaders of the revenue cycle management department. And if you are not familiar with revenue cycle management, that's the people that gets claims paid for hospitals. So when you go to see a doctor and they give you a Band-Aid or they go and you have surgery, there's specific codes that you're supposed to use 
in order to submit to the payer and in turn get reimbursed for that those services. And so um, there's a whole team in the background that's doing that all day, every day inside the hospital system. And so um, Optum actually had this business intelligence tool that actually would integrate with the revenue cycle management tools um, that the hospitals had. And in turn, it would flow data back and forth, and it would actually alert account managers of overpayments or underpayments. And so we would go in as account managers and clean up those overpayments and underpayments for the hospital. And it was great because we actually offered this service for free to a lot of our clients. And it was helpful for our clients because they didn't have a budget for a full-time employee. And so they were like, hey, there's this great service with Optum. They'll come in and they'll do this for us without being an actual FTE. So I, that's really what I did. I, I just went around to a lot of different hospitals. They started to put me in hospitals where the fires were burning, <laughs> where, you know, there was a lot of, of uh, what they called credit balances on a lot of patient accounts. And it depends on the patient volume in the hospital. There could be hundreds of thousands of accounts that you have a whole team of people that are working to try to clean up. And Optum was looking to use a business intelligence tool to do that faster and more automated, as opposed to having the just one person looking at one account, each line item for everything to try to clean that up. So that's essentially what Optum did. Gotcha. That That's uh, hugely valuable, I can imagine, if you're offering that as part of a software investment or not even software investment, but yeah. services investment yeah. for, for organizations and a clear value you add there. So how did, um, talk to us a little bit about the, you know, when the fires were burning, right? Cause that's an often, yeah. that's pretty familiar circumstance that a lot of account managers find themselves in. So what was an example of where there was a gap between the expectations of a customer and the reality of the services offering and how you had to uniquely fill that gap, that value gap, so to speak? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think too, it's, it was a lot of our account managers weren't initially part of the initial conversations of bringing these clients on board. So you have a lot of account managers that get assigned a bunch of accounts and then you're walking in at the time we didn't have anything like a CRM system where we were taking notes. We had Excel spreadsheets and you know, there was a lot of things that we were trying to look at to try to understand the account. We used to build um, actual onboarding guides, which was like, I don't know, to be honest with you, it's like a 60 page word document that you had to update every six months. Right it was like, where do you park? How do you cut checks? Who's the right person to cut the check for you for a credit balance? And so um, there was a, there was a lot, I would say, as far as fires burning. Um, a lot of times it was all just about your ability to navigate that relationship, both strategically, but also transactionally. There's specific transactional things that you're expected to do in this particular role. Um, and at times we had account managers that may not be doing that transactional component of it because the role was essentially remote, but you were, a lot of times the hospitals had expectations of how many days you needed to work at the hospital. So you actually integrated with the team pretty much that was there day to day that was working for the hospital. You were just kind of a colleague, an extension of their team, but you had an expectation to be there on site. And sometimes if I were full transparency, we sometimes didn't have account managers showing up on time. We didn't have account managers always showing up to every shift they were supposed to show up to. And then there were expectations around how much of the work needed to be done. So number of accounts that needed to be cleaned up. Um, and if you weren't using the business intelligence tools you had in place, you were obviously going to work at a slower pace than if you were using this type of tool, which was kind of expected to work faster and quicker. Um, and so there was, I think that was a little bit of it is having the like the right fit regional account manager in the space. Um, revenue cycle management is kind of a beast in its own. Um, and I had been in the space for a couple of years previous to coming on board with Optum, but a lot of my colleagues had never even been in the healthcare space, had never even been. So it's like a whole concept you have to really understand and learn and it takes a while to really 
ramp up and understand that to the point where you can really drive that strategic partnership um, better or more eff efficient or more effectively. And so sometimes we just really didn't have the right fit person in the role. And I think it, that's what happened with, you know, client was expecting to have someone on site four days a week and we weren't doing that or client was expecting so many number of accounts to be reviewed and we weren't delivering on that. And so I think there was definitely an opportunity to make sure we were aligned with what was expected and the account managers we were sending into those hospitals knew what those expectations were. And then in turn, we held them accountable to meet those goals. Gotcha. Gotcha. I think that's such a key piece is ensuring there's alignment between the organization and what the buyer needs and having that documented and memorialized. And so you can, you can create value. Yes. And, and having a, a platform to be able to manage that is, is so critical. Yeah. Um, and you, there's so many ways to like add value in the relationship too, that isn't on paper. You know, there's so many yeah. opportunities that, you know, an effective account manager has the capacity to do and anticipating client needs very, very early. Hey, I think this is going to be something we should focus on or even presenting those as options of how do we drive more efficient processes and deliver things better, faster, quicker, and more effectively for, for our organization. And that Sometimes was there was sometimes misalignment there. There were so many, you know, there's so many unique moments in your ex experience working with customers to add uh, like hero moments, value yes. moments. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. I, I love that concept of value moment. And I want to take yeah. us to your next stage in the journey here and hear more about value moments that happened there. When you were at Practice Suite, when you kept on the path of the revenue cycle management world, wow. and now we're in the, the tech side of things, and the EHR is the actual document system of records for a lot of the healthcare organizations, and yeah. you were owning customer advocacy there, uh, and you had mentioned our pre-chat, there's a lot of churn happening <laughs> across yeah. the organization, um, and not doing a great job of demonstrating value, a lot of escalation. So how did you understand where we had the organization have opportunities to add more value, increase, decrease yeah. the time to value, right? What were some of those value moments that crystallized, hey, we got to do something about this in order yeah. to reduce churn? Yeah, it's so, it's so, sometimes value moments are so hard to like find, like, you know, because moments of value for customers can be you know, a feeling, a sentiment, like, hey, things are easier for me now, or you lifted something off my plate. But there were definitely key features inside of the system that we were like, when you're totally ripping out your entire tech stack that you use every day with your patients, and you're putting a brand new tech stack in, you cannot negatively impact the patient experience. Because at the end of the day, the people we are servicing our healthcare providers servicing patient, patients. Yeah. So the, the yes. need to have this clean transition was so, so incredibly important to do it so seamlessly and with a, the least amount of friction as possible. Because at the end of the day, if we do this poorly, it can impact our ability to provide our, our providers to provide good patient care. And yeah. so we never wanted to be an extension to poor quality care right. in any capacity. <laughs> so yeah. I don't want to be tied to that in any way, mm -hmm. shape or, or any way. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you too, is like, there were, there were definitely moments of, you know, when you're outside of the electronic health record, we always, we also had like a claims um, type of, of what we call it a practice management software. And so you had the ability to actually submit claims um, through what we call electronic data interchange, it sends it to the payer and then it comes back and pays. So once you're submitting your first set of claims and you're getting payments, those are moments of value because it's like, ah, it worked. It didn't yeah. get rejected. It actually passed through or you're putting um, data in a, into an electronic health record or you're submitting something electronically for a prescription and it goes through. Those are actually very big moments that actually is like, ah, things are working. There's opportunities for value. And I think we had a very strong implementation team that worked with customers every single week. They had touch points, but sometimes implementation was six months, 
seven months, nine months. It just depend, dep was dependent on resources that they allocated towards this. You know, there were so many things they needed to do, and sometimes they weren't always doing the things they needed to do um, as fast as they needed to do it. So you kind of had to stay on top of them. And then after implementation, when a customer was live, claims have been submitted, they know how to, you know, request their prescriptions through their pharmacy. They know how to document inside of the electronic health record. Once all of those things are done, then kind of your implementation specialist close the chapter and pass them to support. Yeah. And then that's where the fires burned because right. we didn't, there was no customer success function oh, at all. It was just all support and the support team is completely offshore and so we all, there wasn't a lot of like, uh, I would say team meetings between the implementation team oh and the office support team. So I walked into fires every single day and I was like, this is not what I was expecting. Yeah. But this is what I got. So, yeah. you know, with no judgment too, because every organization has, you know, grows super fast or has their areas yeah. of opportunity for growth. So I walked into it really without an, uh, any sort of judgment about where they were. But I saw many opportunities probably within my first four weeks of working in the organization where we were, where we had clear gaps and ways that we needed to prove or things that we needed to improve. Got it. Got it. Yeah. The, the proverbial kicking the can down the road, right? And yeah. somebody else gets it. I used to be in implementation Oh. on both sides of the spectrum yeah. where I was getting the deals from sales handed off and then I would hand it over to CS at the time. It was also just support. Yeah. And because we did not have a good continuity of understanding why the customer bought in the first place, what they're trying to achieve, what value they need to get. And that was siloed in between organizations. It, it created a discrete, not great continuous experience for the customer. And ultimately that affected our company because we were all, it was piling up, so. Exactly, I, <laughs> and I think too is like, um, we also, I don't know if you've ever experienced this in your career, but sometimes you have certain leaders inside of an organization that the, their product is like the greatest. Oh yeah, for sure. Mankind, and everybody should want this product. Everybody needs it, and everybody has the same goals. Those are yes. some of the conversations we had, and I was like, oh, that's kind of how we treated it like everybody yeah. had the same goals everybody needed this um and it it you know you just saw those moments of friction because to your point there wasn't a good continuous journey um from beginning to end and it it did very much feel like a hot potato situation of like yeah. okay i'm done your turn Yes. Your turn to handle it. And our <laughs> core support team, bless all of their hearts. Oh, <laughs> because goodness. they were just catching everything. I mean, everything. Yeah. Oh, man. Who's supporting the support team, right? We got to get them some Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. We back just up, needed to have sessions up. just yeah. to support the support team. <laughs> <laughs> Too real. Too real. Um, awesome. Well, let's talk about it. And we can transition here to your, to your next role in in the healthcare world at, at home care pulse and also at paradigm seniors we'd love to yeah. understand better your world there but where you're overseeing not just the the a single function but now a couple functions implementation plus customer success yeah. plus now a customer experience at, at where you are today you know how are you how are you what are you responsible for exactly in terms of the different parts of the handoff and how are you aligning those because i feel like you've learned a yeah. lot about how the dangers of creating these silos and it, the handoffs yeah. turn this big pile fire into uh, a support pile fire or wherever that ends. Right. So I'm curious to understand yeah. better. Yeah. You know what? I, I loved my time when I worked at home care pulse, uh, great, great organization, lots of great products that they have too. So um, when I was working at practice suite, there was a, a couple of products we had, like we had a service, which was revenue cycle management. So if somebody wanted to offload uh, their back office billing solution to us, we would do the billing for them. Um, so we had this service side. Um, when I worked at Home Care Pulse, they had three different products. Um, and at the time they were going through an acquisition. So they were acquiring a couple different organizations. So we're throwing a couple new products that are available. But at the end of the day, it was all the service, um, the post-acute care space, which is really like the home care and home health hospice uh, space. 
Um, and so I think really I started off initially just overseeing the function of customer success. Um, there was definitely a need to, you know, outline what was expected in CS and, and really what I found when I walked in the door is that a lot of our customer success managers were kind of a support plus team. They yeah. were expected to have these like, you know, I would say strategic type conversations, but they were so bogged down into the tactical reactive that they could never get outside of that to actually have these strategic conversations. And so we had a support team as well. Um, and that was managed by a customer support manager who also managed the implementation team. Probably about eight months into my journey with Home Care Pulse, there needed to be some alignment between implementation and customer success being yeah. overseen by the same leader. And so I then, uh, you know, started that implementation team started reporting to me. And that was the first time I really had my eyes open to the handoff process from sales. And so that was the first first moment to say, whoa, there's some friction here between <laughs> what our sales team is selling and actually what the right fit customer was. Because sure. I think too, is that there were a lot of like, you know, assumptions about what that ideal customer looks like. And we weren't doing a great job as a post sales team if communicating what a successful customer looks like and what a non successful customer looks like. And so I think that was a, like a really good opportunity for us to say, we have so much friction in implementation that we were like, wow, there was definitely ways we could have, we probably shouldn't have sold this, this deal. Like we, there's definitely, a, how do we make sure we have better pre-screening questions? How do we better qualify our customers? How do we actually say no? Yeah. Are we saying no? Because sure. <laughs> it doesn't, my, that poor implementation team was like, I don't feel like we're saying no. I think we're saying yeah. yes to everybody. <laughs> and so they were, you know, just catching everything. And so that was like the first opportunity to, to really look at, a lot of manual processes. We, there was a lot of growth in the organization. The customer base, you know, tripled in size once new yeah. companies came on board. PE firm owned the organization. So you're starting to see more companies get absorbed and acquired and merged. And you just see moment, all these moments of friction too. And you've got three companies with three different CRM systems and nobody knows what all the products do. Yeah. And so it, that was... That was kind of fun in itself too. But yeah, I think that was like when I started taking over implementation, that was the first time I really was like, I actually really like to be right after post sales to look at that really clearly look at that handoff process and sure. see where we have pain and friction and then try to improve that. And then also being able to map that journey all the way through implementation to the customer success team to utilizing support. Um, there, that was a that was a great experience for me because um, we were dealing with a large volume of customers in a small amount of resources. And so, and there was no, you know, we weren't adding headcount as most organizations yeah. had not adding headcount. Yeah. We were like lean and mean. Um, we were doing everything we could to try to automate, create some digital experiences. That was the first time we in, implemented a new CS tool to try to automate um, components of our onboarding. And so yeah. that's, that's I would say, that's a little bit of my experience at Home Care Pulse, too. It was gotcha. Good. Yeah, that, that's it's a lot a lot there, and when, especially when there's a lot of pressure on the team and not having enough resources to support then you got to get crafty with it right and make you that do happen. you got to get crafty you got to get creative and then it also ends up you end up kind of being the uh it also too is like you found the cs team just i had a lot of uh i would say empathy for the experience of the cs team because it was like the catch-all team for everything <laughs> every mini project every yes. <laughs> you know and then it was like you know as a leader, you had to step in sometimes and really push back on priorities. You know, when other leaders felt like your team should be handling it, sometimes you really had to stand up for your team and make sure they weren't continuing to take hit after hit after hit. Um, because what we want them to do, they weren't able to do it all the way in the most effective way that we could have done it. Um, and so it was just trying to like, you know, 
refine here and there and automate the things we can to lift up some of those, I would say, administrative things for the team. And now that I'm at Paradigm, I'm moving into this customer experience and I'm now realizing everything touches customer experience. Yes. So, so now it's like, oh, now let's look at our sales process. How are we yes. bringing our customers in? You know, how are they using our learning management tool? How are they actually, what channels are they activated in? You know, what technology are they adopting? What technology are they not adopting? And so it's the first time in this organization that someone is taking a very high level view and have a hyper focus on the customer experience. And we're, this organization is going to be so better for it because now you have someone looking at it from beginning to end and there's, it's, it's, it's cool. It's cool. Yeah, so yeah. far, I'm a weekend. So far, it's cool. Yeah. Ask me in six months. I might be stressed yeah. out. But. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you're uniquely, you're uniquely positioned because you've held so many roles on both the buyer's side and the provider's side in, in this world. And then as you were saying before, right, having that awareness um, from the industry and having done it a couple of times yeah. gives you that, that holistic understanding. So I'm rooting for you, Amber. I'm rooting for thank, you. I hope that goes well. I know it will. And, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. I have a unique perspective here, too, because the clients I'm servicing right now, they're actually home care agency owners. And home care agency owners typically are in the personal care services or elder care services. So it's seniors. Um, and I used to be a caregiver in college. Oh, so wow. this is like near and dear to my heart. So I know what, and I also have a grandfather that currently has dementia. So he's going through this process. Right. And so the reason I love the healthcare space is because these, the organizations I choose to work for, I'm driven, like the, I'm so aligned with their mission, their vision and their core values, because wow. what, what we're doing every single day is making a difference in the patient experience, the client experience, the customers. So it just makes me so much more excited about how can I help um, and what can I do to make this better for you? Because if I can make this better for you, guess what? You're going to make it better for my grandparent or yeah. for someone else's grandparent. So I, when you have that connection, it just connects you to your customers so much more. And I have so much empathy and care for the customers that we're servicing because they're doing great work in our community. So, and I want them to do the best they can do. And I don't want to be anything that's burdensome to them. <laughs> for sure. Wow. So. Yeah, it, it's, I think that's also pretty rare and unique, as you said, because we oftentimes, or for me in my world, I haven't ever been in the end user, end customer's shoes, right? It's always selling to somebody else who then yeah. does something with that solution. And uh, I think that's a, that's a really good grounding perspective to have um, yeah. it's just, it's it awesome definitely to connects you to your customers too and yes. you get a little bit of street cred yeah you know, when you're working with you like yeah. i know what you're going through yeah. <laughs> and i guess for in your role now it's all come full circle because the experience you're providing as a vp of cx you have lived in a prior world yeah. in college and now yeah. You can be the, it's so it's really cool to see it all cycle through. That's so awesome. So cool. It's so cool. <laughs> I, I didn't know I was ever going to land here either. Yeah. You know, yeah. The journey is never linear. It's all right. over the place. <laughs> it's all over the place. I love it. I love it. Um, well, this has been great, Amber. I'm going to transition us to the, the final section of our, of our conversation okay. here, which is called the rapid fire question section. So there's a couple of rules. I'm going to ask you eight questions. And I want you to say the first thing that comes to your mind, three words max. So it's a bit tough. But okay. Whatever the first <laughs> the thought pressure. is. Going to be, I know. We gotta, <laughs> gotta heat it up. It's all it's Friday okay. it's Memorial Day, you know? And so we got we got three minutes till five o'clock. So we're gonna we're gonna hit it. We're gonna hit it hard right, right now. Let's go. <laughs> Here we let's go. go. Let's go. All right. Let's all see right. how if it's it's you know late in the evening. Like let's hope this, this train is still mental working. Fortitude, yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So Amber, what's the best metric of success for CS? Mm. Uh moments of value. I love it. What's the worst metric of success for CS? Mm, that promoter score. Yes, I know. I love, I'm a huge. It's trash. <laughs> it was so used in B2C, like transitioning that to B2B. Like, I, yeah, I'm not a fan. Not yeah. A fan. <laughs> I, you're not, you're not alone. I literally recorded a video for my, uh, 
we had a video re- produced which has 12 people on the podcast who've literally said that in ps so <laughs> I'm starting so you're not movement. alone. You're not alone. I'm literally starting a movement called cancelnps.com. <laughs> I, bought, I bought the domain. I did. Oh and my so gosh. That's we're, hilarious. We're, we're doing it and we're going to have like NPS or IP parties and stuff. So that's pretty funny. That's so funny. That's so <laughs> um, funny. Awesome. So moving on here. Lot, lot more than three words, but that was warranted for sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so what's the most underrated part of CS? Mm. Anticipating customer needs. It's a tough one. Mm. Most overrated part of CS. Mm. Mm. I'm probably going to get some heat for this, but executive business reviews. Yeah. I, mm-hmm. it's, it's part of this. <laughs> they, need, yeah. they need, they totally need revamping. They need revamping. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my I'm going to get heat for that, I'm sure. Some people <laughs> really love EBRs and QBRs, but I am i think there's way way more creative ways that we can yeah. give value. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with that one. Um, what's the current state of CS? Mm. I probably redefining. Redefining. Yeah. yeah. We're redefining it. It's, yeah. It's kind of going through a little bit of um, a transition right now, too. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, what about the future of CS? Oh, AI. AI. <laughs> Integrating <not>. human <laughs> touch and digital. Yes. <laughs> but not losing the human. Yes, the element. experience. experience. Yeah, way more than three words. Yes. But. <laughs> um, what's the best book or podcast that you listen to? a book um oh i love donna weber so she did matters so i love her book um podcast oh um digital customer success alex yes and then unchurned has the cs and bs with christy falteroso john johnson joss josh as well and that one's good too okay Nice. Yeah. I haven't heard of that one. I'll look it up. It's a good one. Called Unchurned or CS. It's unchurned. It's, oh. uh, I think it's Update AI, I think hosts okay. it, but it's good. There's a, it's, they, they run a new series called CS and BS and it's good stuff. Plus also the three of them have such good, like such good chemistry with each other. Like you just want to hang out with them when you're yeah. <laughs> like, dang. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I'll check that one out. Yeah. It's good. Cool. Um, awesome. And then the final question here is what's the best community that you're a part of? Oh, I'm success in black. It's my oh. favorite community. Awesome. Yes. It's for black professionals and customer success. And I'm a proud ally, um, and a participant in that group. So it's, how do we get more representation of people in color inside of the CS space? So it's my favorite community. Love it. That's a really good one. Yeah, it's good. Awesome. Well, Amber, nearing the end here, uh, so the final questions for you is if you could make one prediction about the future, where we're headed, you mentioned AI, of course, is one of the, the themes, but um, where, where do you think we're going in CS and as an industry as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think AI is definitely going to be hopefully this supplemental tool that can be used to help reduce the administrative burden on our CSMs. Um, I really do hope that's the direction we go. And maybe it allows our opportunity for our CSMs to do things more strategically and the things we need them to do better and they can do it more consistently. Um, That's that's what I think. Also, I think a lot of leaders are going to be playing with a lot of new AI tools that are out there. There's so many different options now, too, that, you know, it's like trying to find the right AI tool, but also... um, there's questions around security and, you know, so I think that'll be a good, good topic of discussion that a lot of us will have inside for organizations if we're considering AI and bringing AI into, into the space. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, everywhere, a lot of uh, yeah. capabilities of existing software platforms are embedding it. And then also you've got the, the big players, chat, GPT, et cetera, yeah. that are you know, all these people are exploring there. Yeah. Uh, sweet. Well, before we wrap here, Amber, is there anything you'd like to plug with the audience? 
anything I'd like to plug. Oh my gosh. Listen to this podcast. Yes, listen to it. <laughs> we'll find it on Spotify. No, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, the best thing too is like this community is so wonderful and I think it gives so much. People give so much of their time through mentorship and things like that. My thing is like, just find ways to stay connected to people in this space because it's such a wonderful community to be a part of. So I'm lucky to be here. I'm lucky to be on your podcast. I'm lucky to be a be a participant in this journey of CS as it evolves as an industry. And I'm excited to continue this journey. So love it, Amber. I love it. And congratulations to you again on your promotion and you. the journey that you're on. And I know you've got a big group of supporters. Uh, named a couple of them already that um, be cheering you on, including myself. So thank you so much for being on the thank show today. You. Awesome. Thank you. Once again, thank you for listening. This episode is brought to you by Foresight. If you're interested in learning more, please email them at info at gainforesight.co. That is info at G-A-I-N-F-O-R-E-S-I-G-H-T dot C-O. Thank you.